Good evening, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us um, once again for Garden Hour, a weekly program brought to you by SDSU Extension Horticulture Specialists, as well as special guests. Um, we're here to provide you timely updates for your garden and talk about the pests and weather and problems and beautiful blooms that we're seeing this week or the week past. Um, as always, we invite all of you to ask questions throughout the program, and you can do that by using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. So um, my name is Christine Lang. I'm an SDSU assistant professor and consumer horticulture extension specialist based in Brookings, but serving gardeners statewide. And joining me this evening is John Ball, who's an SDSU professor, extension forestry specialist, and South Dakota Department of Agriculture Forest Health Specialist. John, what are you going to be talking about tonight? Well, I'm going to be talking about all the flowers that aren't that nice. So that's my uh, that's my lead in for this evening. <laughs> all right. So maybe some stinky flowers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and also joining us this evening is Rhoda Burroughs, SDSU professor and extension horticulture specialist. And Rhoda, what will we be hearing about from you tonight? That darn mute. I'm going to be talking about a weed you can eat, and then I'm going to be discussing uh, hail damage. I imagine a few of you have experienced that joy in the past week or so. All right, so some good and some bad this week. And I'm going to be kicking us off. And I know I've been away for a couple of weeks, so I'm going to reflect on some questions I've received and um, also be sharing some of those gorgeous blooms that do smell good. So we'll get a little bit of the, the good, the bad, and the ugly tonight. Um, so last time I was on Garden Hour, I touched briefly on um, this, this planter right here that used the coconut fibers as a liner um, that the bird was supposedly making nest material out of. And that led to some follow-up questions later that week regarding um, growing vegetables in containers. Um, based on, you know, data from, from other sources, as well as my own experiences, there are a lot of vegetables that will do well in containers, but some take home messages is you want to look for words such as compact. If you're looking for tomatoes, you want to look for words such as determinate, because those are going to set their fruit all at once. And they're not going to continue to grow and grow and grow like a vine, which is what indeterminate tomatoes do, or look for words such as bushy. Um, and another thing to consider when growing in containers is container size, especially as we head into these hotter months of July and August. If you're someone who travels a lot on the weekends or, um, you know, is, is going to be away for extended periods of time, um, if you don't want to drive yourself nuts watering, um, especially if you're using watering cans like I am, you're going to want to look for containers that are 12 inch diameter or larger. Um, those smaller 8, 10, 6 inch pots can be really difficult to keep watered. Um, previously, I've done herbs in smaller pots, but um, if they're in full sun conditions, they're going to dry out before you get home from the end of the workday and you're going to have plants that are doing well and then looking really poor and wilting and doing well and wilting, and it could be really frustrating. Additionally, if you're doing fruiting crops such as tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, having those larger containers also provides a larger base of soil and support so that as that tomato, eggplant, pepper starts to grow up and become more top heavy, you have that mass of soil to counterbalance it and keep it from tipping over. Um, so these are some of the containers that are on my own um, in my own garden this year. Again, they're all deeper, taller, holding large amount of water. Of course, all of these have annual flowers in them, so they're not a great example of vegetables. But here's a photo from last year. This was a container eggplant I grew that did really well. And it was actually an All-American Selections winner for container eggplant. And this was called Hansel. It was, um, I would say, a little bit more slender and didn't get as large as some of our traditional purple eggplants do, but it was really nice for slicing and frying and honestly kind of those nice single serve um, type eggplants. 
Some other things to consider with vegetables for containers, a lot of our leafy greens um, or crops that we use as leafy greens do really well in containers. You can take multiple cuttings of them, you can direct sow them. And so on the left, I have arugula, which is one of my new favorite greens. It has kind of a, a warm, zesty, nutty flavor, if you will, and has done really well in the cool season. What's interesting about this planting is I put a few transplants in this bed, and then I direct seeded around it because the transplants weren't looking great. And um, I can't tell you what in this is um, the transplant versus the direct sowing. So I think that's a testament for a leafy green such as arugula or something like spinach, just directly seeding it in your container or raised bed will be really successful. Um, and over here on the right, this is Swiss, Swiss chard from last year that was interplanted with chenille plant. Note, chenille plant was just for show as a flowering annual. Um, I'm, I tend to mix a lot of annual flowers and vegetables together. The chenille plant, not edible as far as I know. So disclaimer right now, don't eat things unless you know they're actually edible from a trusted, credible source. So don't eat the chenille plant. Um, but again, this was in, in a raised, like a small window box style um, container, raised bed, if you will, and Swiss chard did really, really well. Plus, by having all those greens front and center, it's a great reminder that you should consume them on a regular basis. So these are on my patio where I see them in the morning when I, um, if I have time to sit and drink coffee, um, I see it and it's a reminder to eat a salad that evening. So if you're looking for more recommendations on vegetable varieties for containers, here are two of my favorite lists. Um, University of Wisconsin put together a really nice list on vegetable varieties for containers, and they have that on their website that was updated just um, within the last year or so. And then another great spot to look, and I've already refer referenced it once, and I know I shared this about a month ago, but it's nice to revisit. All American Selections is a nonprofit research group, and they work with land grants and public gardens across the United States to um, host trial gardens. And vegetable and annual flower and perennial breeders will enter their plant material into this trial program. And they are actually blind um, comparisons. So um, we, we host these trials at McCrory Gardens. We do in-ground annual flower trials. And I'll be looking at a, you know, one, one type of zinnia compared to two other zinnias that are already on the market. I have no idea what the name of the trial zinnia is or what breeder submitted it, so I can't have any bias that way. And we about evaluate the performance of those plants um, based on our South Dakota conditions on the eastern side of the state. And again, these trial gardens are nationwide. There's, um, there's a site at Colorado State University, for example, um, if folks are interested in kind of those West River plants that do well. And with All American Selections, you can go to their website and look up the term container suitable, and you can sort that by vegetables and start to see, um, they even have recommendations on vegetables that might do well in a hanging basket. For example, I know there's a tomato called Terenzo that stays quite small that, um, if, if memory serves me right, in the photo for All American Selections, they show it in a hanging basket. So not something I've done yet, but it is something that can be done. So ideas for vegetables for containers. Um, I know we're getting to the point where people probably have most of their gardens planted. Although to be fair, we just put our squash trials in last Friday. So there's still time for some of those warm season crops. And we're also gonna be looking ahead to a fall planting for broccoli. So if you're looking to fill a few containers and take advantage of some of those, um, you know, end of spring sales at garden centers, there are definitely options out there. So um, with the heat cranking up and with some of our recent rains, many of you are probably, hopefully your garden doesn't look like this. Um, this is for a research project that um, Rhoda Burroughs, myself and my graduate student are working on. We're looking at integrating clover cover crops um, with for vegetable production. And this was prior to mowing. So this current mess that you see in front of you included an oat nurse crop the clover, as well as many, many weeds under there. And we spent time going out into the field collecting data on the presence of weeds versus cover crops in this site. But I just show this um, 
to kind of exemplify the point that things are growing really quickly right now. And um, so pay attention to weed management in your garden. And I've been getting questions and you know heard chatter through the garden hotline that people are really curious about using fabric for weed management in gardens. And I have fabric in quotations very intentionally. Um, what we call landscape fabric um, might also be referred to as ground cloth. It's important to note that this is a plastic based material that's woven and you can get this from garden centers, landscape suppliers. I'm seeing um, some, you know, seed companies and different sources are starting to sell this online. This is an option for weed management in annual gardens. Um, we're seeing this used more on cut flower farms as well as some of our small scale vegetable farms. And it often looks like what you see in front of you where um, you, know, you have a long row of fabric and holes have been burned in this fabric and you're planting into that. Again, a great possible weed management strategy. There are some things to consider if you're gonna be doing this. Um, soil temperatures are gonna get quite a bit warm, could potentially get warmer under that fabric you'll want to think about how you're gonna be watering um, the system. So for our production system, for our lab, we use a drip irrigation tape that is actually placed under this fabric. Um, so we have a way to deliver water underneath. These woven fabrics are technically permeable, so they do allow air and water and gas exchange, but Oftentimes, if you overhead water, um, you know, I've watered in plants on these systems before, you will still see ponding on that fabric and sometimes it runs off the shoulders. In the two recent rainfall events we've had here on campus, I've noticed that the water, you know, it is wet under the fabric, it's soaked into the holes. I can't say the exact volume of water under the fabric as compared to um, an, an area of this research trial where it's just been tilled bare ground. We are hoping to install moisture sensors, so I hope to have that data for you um, in the future, but we just were, were in our first year of this trial and don't have that collected yet. Um, other things to consider, it's really windy in South Dakota. Um, my, my team and I had a lot of discussions about how many landscape staples do you need to hold down this fabric, and typically you're using what's called a sod staple or a landscape staple. Um, they come in six to eight inch lengths. They probably come longer, but we used eight inch staples on the corners just to get those edges nice and secure. And then we put six inch staples about every two feet. Um, this is a really open windy site where we are. And we pulled that fabric nice and tight because the other problem, if you get fabric that starts to blow, not only might it leave your vegetable or flower garden, but um, that that action of, of blowing could cause that fabric to move up and down and start to rub on the stems of the plants. Um, the, the hole size used here, that's a three inch diameter hole. And I'm gonna skip ahead here to show you how we did that. And we had some lessons learned here. Um, when you cut this type of fabric, you'll end up with bits and pieces of the woven plastic material that'll just start to unravel and it'll be a complete mess. So cutting this with like a scissors or a knife um, is not generally recommended for these uses. When we cut our cut our pieces to length, we actually just burned um, using a propane burner straight across to, again, air quotes, cut that piece so that all of those edges were cauterized. And then to make the holes, um, this is for pepper planting. So there are 18 inches between these two rows and there's 12 inches within the row, which is one of the recommended plant spacings for a double row of peppers for kind of a commercial production setting. Um, but we made a wooden template, again, used a hole saw. And then my colleagues had a propane burner attachment and we turned that flame down fairly low and we placed it right over those template holes. And one of the things my students observed is originally we had this fabric rolled out just on the gravel driveway and the template wasn't really pinching the fabric tight. And it tended, when you burn that fabric, it tended to shrink up more and kind of distort. So we discovered that putting it on a piece of concrete um, in an outdoor setting worked a lot better. Um, I've read about blogs from flower farmers where people will do this indoors. 
you need to obviously be really careful not to light yourself or anything in your building on fire. Also with using a propane or a butane type torch, you'd want a well-ventilated space so that you're not um, inhaling a lot of fumes and putting yourself at risk that way. Um, and again, this is how we laid the landscape fabric in the garden or in our, in our research trial, and it would look similar in your garden. And you can get, this is three foot wide fabric. You can get much wider. It just depends on how big of a pickup truck you have to take a roll of fabric home and how big of pieces you wanna manage. Um, and you can see here, um, this was one of our no-till treatments. We had just mowed down the weeds and cover crop and unrolled that fabric right over the top of it. And even having those weeds caused that fabric to be a little bit looser and more uneven. Um, and again, we're doing this intentionally for the sake of research, but I think goes to show that managing those weeds very intentionally before you put down that fabric, whether it's you know mowing really close to the surface or using a solarization step to really truly kill those weeds so they die down to the soil surface um, so you can get that landscape fabric tight or having a tillage pass to prepare that soil bed. And um, again, these are annual systems. At the end of the season, we're gonna roll these pieces of fabric up, store them for the season and put them out again next year. And that way they can be cleaned up. Um, if these were to sit out over winter, I've seen some cases from other colleagues with landscape fabric, a lot of that blew away in the winter. Um, so I don't wanna lose all of our landscape fabric over winter and have it blowing into someone else's field. That's not a great way to make friends on campus. Um, and again, it's a chance to open up that soil, allow for rainfall and leaching, and to hopefully give um, you know insects and other creatures that want to burrow into that soil and emerge earlier in the spring, give them a chance to still have a home in this garden space. So those are some considerations for landscape fabric, and would look forward to hearing from folks who have tried this or are thinking about trying this in the future. Um, and wrapping up my segment, um, there. We, we've had some delays this season due to cool weather. Um, you know, I've been waiting for peonies and as I walk around campus, the peonies are absolutely gorgeous right now here in Brookings. And some of you might be noticing the same thing. Again, the bloom window for peonies can depend on the cultivar. Um, unfortunately, I don't know the, the specific cultivar name of either of these two beauties. They were in one of the older garden plantings on campus. Um, but if I find out, I'll be sure to update you next time. Um, some things to consider with peonies. If you've got a peony planting in your garden and it's starting to not bloom as well as it has in previous seasons, some things to ask yourself are, you know, is it an older planting? Peonies don't need to be divided very often, but if you're starting to see a dwindling number of stems and a lack of blooms and it's been in your garden for, um, three plus years. Um, some peony plantings don't need to be divided. They can, you know, just continue to grow for at least 10 years. But if if it's an older farmstead type planting and you're noticing blooms starting to dwindle, it might be time to divide those plants. If it's a newer planting and you're noticing issues with blooms, one of the first things to ask yourself is what are the sunlight conditions? Peon Peonies do best in full sun conditions. I grew up with some plants that were in a fairly shady location, and we just made peace with the fact that we weren't going to get as many blooms as some of the other gardeners in the area. Um, but that's one thing to consider. And peonies are a really rough and tough plant. They don't need a lot of fertilizer. And in fact, if you are dumping nitrogen fertilizer on your peonies, that could also result in poor bloom production because you're, you're losing blooms due to the volume of foliage that's being put out instead. Um, so some considerations there. And for more information on peonies, we do have an article on the FDSU Extension website that was originally authored by Dr. David Graper. Um, and finally, don't, don't get really antsy about dividing and moving your plants right now. Hold off and wait to do that in the fall. That's gonna be the best time to do so. And just a quick PSA, it's going to be hot this weekend. Um, pay attention to those containers and raised beds. Make sure you give them a nice deep watering. Um, between the wind and the heat, our, our annual plants, my, I, I expect this might be the last really nice flush of blooms I'm going to see from my cool season pansies. And in the background is the nasturtium. They're a heat-loving plant. They're likely going to take over.
All right. Okay, I'm going to work backwards on these questions and then I'm going to also um, enlist Rhoda for, for two of the first questions. So um, there's a question about how do you clean the landscape fabric? You know what, I'm going to have a lot more information on that this fall after me and my team do it, but um, you know, one of the best things to do would be removing it when conditions are dry so you can, I picture it like kind of shaking out an old rug. So I've heard from other farmers that you know you shake all that dust and mud off and then they roll it up. Um, I think there'd be potential to wash it that could be fairly labor intensive and also then you still have to wait for that wet fabric. So I think my goal this fall is going to be dry conditions, roll it up, shake it off as we go. But that's an excellent question. Again, the landscape fabrics are not perfect, but um, we're looking forward to not having to weed as much all summer. <laughs> um, so two more questions. Rhoda, what's the latest date that rhubarb should be harvested? There's kind of a rule of thumb by the 4th of July. Now, if you want to sneak just a stalk or two later on, but don't get real wild. But if you want just a little bit, uh, you can do that. But but your main harvest should be over with by, you know, the first week of July or so to allow the plant to put energy back into the roots for next year. Excellent. And Rhoda, I see you were ready to answer the next question. So I'll let you cue that one up. Oh. Yeah, this was was uh, from Rapid City, uh, a person's zucchini is wilting and she's wondering if it was all the rain. Well, it might depend where in Rapid City you are. I haven't gotten quite enough rain to wilt <laughs> plants yet, but but I know some of the other areas of town have gotten a little bit more. Um, but one thing I would check is to see if possibly we have some vine borers already. Mm -hmm. Seems a little early for them, but I would check and you would check the, the bottom of your, at the base of the plant and see if you see any little holes with what looks almost like sawdust coming out from them. And that would indicate a vine borer. And you can actually, uh, if that's the case, you can actually take a little knife or, or pencil or something and just slit that stem open a little bit and look for a little white larvae on the inside and and you can squish the larvae and uh, uh, then cover the base of the plant uh, with moist soil keep the soil moist uh, so it's covering a couple nodes up so maybe a couple inches up sometimes the plant will actually re root itself in time to save the plant so those are my two ideas. We do occasionally have some rotting diseases. Uh, fusarium has been, uh, I've seen fusarium rot some squash in, in the Rapid City area. So if you're not sure and it, it continues to go down, uh, bring the whole plant, roots and all, if you're taking it out. Uh, here to our extension office in front of Menards and we can take a closer look. Excellent. Thank you, Rhoda. All right, John, I think it's time to talk about those smelly flowers. We're going to turn it over to you. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get her started here. Let's come on, click, go. There we go. All right. Well, first of all, my degree days, and by the way, they just skyrocketed in the last week here. When you start getting temperatures in the 90s, um, consistently the high 80s, it's going to accumulate very quickly. So Aberdeen's actually uh, gone over 500, which typically is kind of the beginning of our really bloom period for a lot of our woody plants. And then Sioux Falls is now up to 742. So there's a lot in bloom, though. They're a little late. Uh, the yellow woods have just started flowering on campus, and typically they're blooming by the end of May. And they are one of our most fragrant trees. Uh, when they're in bloom, it just perfumes the air for about a block or two, and it's just a nice light scent uh, when they're in flower. And they're the one of the last trees to leaf out, so it's kind of the middle of May. These weren't even in leaf, and now here they are, full leaf, of course, and in full bloom. 
a uh, little bit of a fall color in the fall, but they drop their leaves early too. But uh, when they're in flower, it's almost impossible to beat them. My mention today too, it is Flag Day. And I'm sure a lot of our viewers are aware of that. South Dakota is pretty good about putting out the flags. I was out uh, doing tree inventories today out in uh, Huron and driving back through uh, Arlington. They always do an excellent display out there uh, for Flag Day. And as a reminder for everybody, this is the 247th birthday of the United States Army. And it was formed on the 14th of June back in 1775. And I doubt if there's too many that remember that. We're all much younger than that, but happy birthday. Um, and of course, now that we're past that 550 uh, degree day threshold, emerald ash borers are emerging. And in our sample areas that I'm working with in the Canton and Sioux Falls area, you can easily find new D-shaped exit holes. And so I get a lot of calls from people saying, well, is this the exit hole for the Emerald Ash Bore? You know what? There really isn't going to be any doubt. It is a definite crisp D-shape. If you got to think whether or not it's D-shaped, it's not, is probably my best way of phrasing it. And it's only going to be, well, it's going to be less than an eighth of an inch uh, wide. So it's not going to be very large. And by the way, if you see it low on the trunk, that's a zombie tree. The tree is pretty much dead. Uh, typically, they'll start emerging fairly high in the canopy. And as the canopy dies, since they are light-loving insects, they're going to be laying more eggs lower on the trunk where they're still living phloem. But by the time they're laying eggs lower on the trunk, that tree's pretty much gone. But right now, yes, you can find the D-shaped holes from the most recent emergence and the adults are out. They're not easy to catch. And by the way, they do like to play dead. That's a characteristic of our growlis that I learned about 40 years ago. And so if you're really gentle with them, they'll actually sit there for a second because they're possums. But they're about a 16th of an inch wide, about three eighths to a half inch long. As you can see, they're that very bright metallic green color. They are daytime flyers, usually out from about 10 to 3. You're not going to see them flying when it's in the 90s. They're not stupid. Uh, they're going to sit back in the shade somewhere. So the ideal temperature for them is really in the 70s, bright, sunny, uh, upper 70s, midday. You'll find them out flying. But again, usually they're up in the canopy. So you're not likely to see them very easily unless you're willing to spend a little time stalking them, uh, which I've done. Uh, they do feed on the leaves. And in fact, the uh, female has to feed on the leaves for about a week or so before she mates. And then about another two weeks before egg laying occurs. So we really don't have any eggs out there yet. So it's still a good time to get out there and treat if you've not done so already. Again, for people that have valuable ash trees within Minnehaha or uh, Lincoln County. Uh, that's where we're recommending treatments. But uh, again, they're going to feed for about a leaf or so. And the adults live for about three weeks. And our last one started emerging mid-July. And that means by the end of August, uh, we don't have adults present anymore. And by the way, a very small branch, could you could have 10 or 15 emerge from that small piece. And I'm going to show you next week uh, on that. Well, hey, how about some other trees? Here's a close relative of ash. And because of that, I do have to put a note of caution, it can become infested with emerald ash borer. But it's more of a rarity than, than common, so that wouldn't scare me from planting it. And we planted a bunch on campus, and they're in full bloom right now. I will say this is from about, uh, what, uh, Highway 14 South? Uh, wouldn't do very well in Watertown, probably wouldn't grow at all in Aberdeen, but in Rapid City area, uh, Pier, uh, Brookings, South Dakota, and South, it's kind of a tall shrub we haven't really thought a lot about, but we ought to, because look at that. You can see why it gets the name Fringe Tree, and it's just very lightly scented. So if you're looking for an interesting shrub, which again, I will point out, since it is closely related to ash, it has become occasionally attacked by one, but 
uh, it's relatively rare. Uh, fringe tree is a nice choice out there. And let's go through some of the others in bloom. I, I mentioned this one, common lilac. This is sensation. I think it's one of the prettier ones. And of course, common lilacs are pretty much bloomed and faded by now. There are still a few that are out in bloom. And if you're up in the Aberdeen area, of course, uh, there's far more in bloom. But that's kind of the start of the bloom period of lilacs. And sometimes we think, well, the common lilac French hybrids, are really about the only ones out there, but no, they're not. Uh, uh, about a week or so ago, our dwarf Korean lilacs were in full bloom. And these are wonderful plants. Now they can get about seven or eight feet tall. Don't let the name dwarf fool you. Uh, some of them get quite tall, so make sure you're getting a, a proper selection. But it's kind of a spicy sort of fragrance to them. Uh, not as powerful as a common lilac, and it's not quite the same, but nevertheless, a very pleasant fragrance. And right now in the Brookings area and down to Sioux Falls, where the Miss Kim lilacs are in bloom. And, and these will definitely get about five to eight feet tall. So they're going to be a little taller than the dwarf Korean, uh, maybe a little shorter than our common lilacs, but they're in full bloom right now. Now, the Miss Kims do not have a powerful fragrance at all. You pretty much got to put your nose up right to them to catch it. But when you do, again, it's a very light uh, fragrance to it, very pleasant. But think of this, we've got three lilacs that you could have a month or so of blooms by having cultivars of the three of these out there. And then now I'm just beginning to see a few of the late lilacs starting to flower. Uh, I took this picture down in Canton a couple of days ago and a few of them are just beginning, but now we're getting into the smelly lilac season. And if you stick your nose into a late lilac bloom, it's probably not gonna be pleasant. They have kind of a, what's been called a privet-like odor. And think of it as old tennis shoes that have been stuffed in a lock, gym locker for maybe a year. And fortunately, that's not a powerful odor. Uh, it's kind of musky, like I mentioned. And if you put your nose up to them, many people, of course, are disappointed the first time they do that. Most of them learn late lilacs, you look at the flowers, you enjoy them in June. You don't smell them. You're not going to put them in a vase and bring them in your house. Well, so what else out there is in bloom, but best enjoyed at a distance? Mountain ash. European mountain ash in particular. These reek. They, they smell horrible. And unfortunately, that odor can actually kind of waffle out into a patio area. If you want to get people to leave your patio, plant European mountain ash around. Uh, the flower, I mean, the fruit's nice, flowers are pretty, but it's going to be one of those plants. It's going to be, thank goodness, it's through blooming. Uh, if you're one of these folks who likes to open your windows in the evening, this is not a plant to have next to it. The other one, and these are just starting to bloom, is the airwood viburnums. Now, this has a well, this is a planting on campus. And if you walked up to it, you'd wonder what died at the base of this plant that somehow is dead and rotting underneath it. And no, it's not some bunny that died or something else like that. It's actually the flowers. Again, you have to get next to the plant to smell it. But you will smell it, particularly if you get your nose next to the blossoms themselves. So I'm not discouraging planting arrowwood viburnum. It's a wonderful plant. Put it at a distance where you can enjoy it. And again, it's not going to go through your entire yard. So I'm fine with, the, with using it. In fact, we use it on campus. And it's a nice looking plant. It just doesn't smell nice. And the worst of the pack. Coxpur hawthorn. Unfortunately, this one, you can pick that up 20 or 30 feet away and you'll swear somebody bunched a dead, a bunch of dead carp underneath it. 
because it smells like rotted flush. Isn't that nice? I mean, isn't that the plant you want to put in your yard? Uh, but has thorns, there's a thornless cultivar. Nothing eats the fruit in the fall. It's just going to lie there all winter. Why we plant it, I don't know. People see a picture of it, say it's got pretty white flowers. Flowers are very pretty, but oh my gosh, do they smell. We have this planted on campus, again, I guess, because they're pretty. And as I walk by, buy it on my way to the library or something like that 30 or 40 feet away in a nice south wind and i'm on the north side of them yeah it smells it smells like gosh somebody piled a bunch of dead fish under the plant now what's interesting about that is if you go up there right now they are covered with what appears to be bees they're not bees they're hoverflies and if you get close you'll notice yeah they're not bees they only have two wings one one pair of wings rather than two and that and they're not going to bite you uh they kind of like dead things and these smell like dead things and, and quite it's interesting but they do contain a chemical that is given off by decomposing flush I'll bet with that description, you all want to run out and buy this plant. Uh, and yeah, go ahead, put it in your neighbor's yard so you can look at it from a distance. Uh, but yeah, you don't want this one up close if you've got any uh, sense of smell whatsoever. During COVID, when everybody lost their sense of smell, not a bad plant. But otherwise, when it's in bloom, it's a horrible plant. Well, what's the other couple of horrible things there to kind of wrap up my segment? Getting lots of calls on hackberry. Hackberry are dropping their leaves. You'll notice their leaves are kind of tattered. The leaves are curling and dropping. This is kind of hackberry tatters. We see it every few years when we have a very cool to cold May. And if you remember, we had some very warm days at the end of April. I, I went back through the records. It hit 91 in uh, uh, what uh, Mitchell at the end of April. And then, of course, it dropped down to 30 a few days later. And we had these highs and lows throughout the state. And it really hit the hackberries. And it hit a lot of maples too, by the way. So we have a lot of them that were just partially uh, opening up and that was it. Now, a lot of these are recovering now. So no worries. But on the hard maples, the sugar maples, some of those have just flat out died from this temperature fluctuation that we went through end of April, early May. And um, on my last two pictures, we're starting to see gulls appearing. This is hackberry nipple gull, which appears. It's caused by a little small snippet wasp. It won't bite you. It's not something that's going to sting you. But it does form these little gulls, and its young feed within there. They, the gulls are actually part of the leaf itself. The chemicals they inject into it uh, cause the plant tissue to form around them. So they're kind of eating in their own house there. Uh, there's nothing you can do once you see them. There's really nothing, not much you can do to prevent them from affecting a plant. It's just going to happen with hackberries and you just deal with it. And the other one I've been getting calls on is this. The spindle galls are showing up on a lot of different plants. I'm seeing them on elms and I'm seeing them on uh, this case. It's a, a little leaf linden and these are caused by mites. And they'll call these little, you can see why they're called spin, uh, spindle galls or nail galls or finger galls. They do not harm the leaf, uh, nor do does the hackberry nipple gall harm the leaves of those. So it's really an aesthetic issue. It's kind of like zits on a teenager, if you will. Uh, they're not going to die, might not go to the prom, but other than that, it's not a big deal. Uh, so you know what, just kind of ignore them and you're fine. So that's my kind of uh, take for the evening. Uh, you know, we're seeing a lot of things starting to pop up. Uh, some things were dying now just because of that cold snap we have, like I say, the hard maples, other trees are coming back from it. But if you're gonna get out there and smell the flowers, make sure you know what it is first, because in some cases you're gonna get a whiff of something you really don't want. So with that, I will uh, stop my sharing and uh, and kind of conclude my little segment. <laughs>
really good advice, John. Know before you smell. I think that's a good life mantra. (laughs) (laughs) I like that. (laughs) So it looks like we've had several woody plant questions coming into the chat. So I'll start throwing those your way. Um, The first first one is, are fringe trees deer resistant? Ooh. You know what? I, I don't know. I'm suspecting so because I've not seen any trouble with Bambi on any of the plantings that I've seen, but I am going to check and give you a more positive answer next week. All right. Excellent. The next one, as we think about where things grow north to south in the state is, can the Miss Kim Lilac grow in Aberdeen? Miss Kim uh, Lilac can grow in your freezer. Uh, it's uh, Manchurian lilac is the species. So if you think of the Asian equivalent of South Dakota, that where, that's where it grows. So that's an excellent question. But yes, it's one of the toughest lilacs we have along with common lilac. Uh, they're bomb proof. Uh, you know, your house could be gone. Uh, everything's disappeared. Nobody waters them and darn if they can't live. Oh, and I'll say this one more thing with the Miss Kim lilac. It's the only lilac to have a fall color. Now, admittedly, it's not a bright red, more of a burgundy. And you're, you're talking to a colorblind guy. So this is what people tell me it looks like. But it does have a hint of a fall color. So uh, that's another plus for growing the Miss Kim. Even grow in Fargo, North Dakota. That's how you know they're they're hardy, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, if they grow in Fargo, which is what uh, about uh, fifteen feet south of the North Pole, uh, yeah, yeah, they'll grow there. But yeah, it's a Manchurian lilac, so incredibly tough. So the next one is about containing honeysuckle. Um, can honeysuckle be planted in a large container such as a tank to keep it from spreading? Well. It won't spread, but the seeds it has will still spread because the birds will eat it and deposit the seeds everywhere. So, yes, you can keep a honeysuckle from expanding by putting it in a container. But since the birds will deposit seeds, those little red berries with a seed in it, deposit them everywhere, you might get some of your neighbors coming up and hooking that container up to a trailer and driving it away. Um, Now, oh, I should double check, though, because some people call uh, the dwarf bush honeysuckle, just honeysuckle, and perhaps they're thinking of that. So for everybody listening... There is a plant called a dwarf bush honeysuckle that has no relationship to honeysuckle at all, but it's a low creeping plant and uh, yellow flowers in the summer to fall, a little bit of a fall color, but yes, it will ramble on banks and everywhere else. That one, yes, if you put it in a container, you have limited its expansion and it's not really invasive in the sense of now you're going to have birds planting seeds everywhere because it produces a small capsule instead. So if you said, well, you know what? I like a little planting of the dwarf bush honeysuckle. I'm going to put it uh, in a big container. That'll do it. A lot of times on campuses and that will plant it where it's surrounded by sidewalks. So it can't really expand as well. It is another tough as nails plant. So if you're talking about the dwarf bush honeysuckle, great idea. If you're talking about the true honeysuckle, yeah, it's not going to go anywhere, but the birds are still going to put the seeds everywhere. Excellent. And rounding out our woody plant questions, thinking back to that viburnum, um, can I give my viburnum a hard trim in early spring next year? Will it grow back? The answer is yes, it will grow back. It will not flower. And the reason for that is the uh, viburnums form their flower buds on the previous year's wood. So with the exception of one of the last ones to bloom, which is the arrowwood viburnum, you'll probably forfeit almost all your flowers if you prune it hard. Generally, what we look at is pruning them after they bloom with the exception of the arrowwood viburnum. Uh, But if you say, wait a minute, my plant's way out of control. Yeah, just go for it. Just figure for that one year, next year, 2023, you will have very few blooms on it because it's going to be regaining all that foliage mass. The following year, you'll get flowers back. 
Excellent. So the last question is going to be a perfect segue to vegetables and weather, Rhoda. So I'll let you take that question and fold it into your time. All right. And we'll be sharing screen the the uh, the question was. Uh, are extreme temperatures causing germination problems? Um, probably more a case of, if we can get this to come up, more a case of moisture than temperature. Um, if you can see now, our four inch soil temperatures across the state are actually perfect germination uh, temperatures for a whole lot of plants. So it's probably not that it might be after this <laughs> next week and if we get temperatures in close to 100, but uh, but it's probably more a case of, of it uh, drying out a little bit. Um, so these are the four inch soil temperatures as of today. And you can see that most of the state has moved in the 70s. We even have a couple 80s. Um, still got Custer out there. It was 68, and I'm not sure that's Sturgis or where. Um, and, the, and then up in the upper Northwest. Now, if you're still thinking about planting potatoes, you didn't get it done, or you're still uh, thinking about getting some, Potatoes will do best if you plant them before the soil temps stay above 70. So those of you in the northwest corner of the state, go for it. For the rest of us, eh, they may still grow. They may still be fine. There's just a much higher increase of chance of getting various pathogens in them and, and having your potatoes rot instead of produce uh, plants. So uh, just Keep that one in mind. Speaking of warmer temperatures, this is a warm season weed that we start to see when I when it gets hot out, and uh, we've got you can see a close up of the seedling here. I haven't noticed it in my garden yet, uh, but again, we may in a week or two. Can it be a useful companion plant? And the, and the reason I brought this forward tonight is I ran across paper on it used as a companion plant because it can absorb salts from soil. So they were testing a saline soil, high salt soil, uh, planting it with tomatoes and found that the tomatoes did better when growing with purslane in this high salt soil because the the purslane was taking away some of the salt from the from the tomato roots so um, a very specialized uh, situation there but might be useful in a high tunnel which tends to get salts build up over time but purslane you might have heard me talk other years is actually edible and it's an extremely good source of omega-3 fatty acids which are known to be very good for us. It uh, has vitamins A, C, and E in quite high amounts. Uh, it's got potassium, magnesium, and, and even 25% of your iron for the day in uh, 100 grams which has only seven calories. So uh, if you're on a diet and need good nutrition, uh, this should be the plant for you. You can eat the leaves raw in a salad. Uh, you just might want to make sure that it's not someplace where it's been sprayed, of course. Or uh, if you're like my yard and have a lot of deer come through, I only eat weeds from within the fence that keeps out the deer because I don't really want to eat uh, raw deer poop. So uh, anyway, uh, so consider this. Uh, it's not all bad. Of course, you might not want to let it go completely uh, to town, but maybe uh, nibble on, the, on a few of the fresh new growth each week. The bottom line is it's good for your eyes, for your heart, 
for your bones, for your skin. Uh, studies have shown it may help prevent cancer. It's got a number of anti-cancer compounds in it. Uh, it helps your blood uh, pressure and, and may reduce strokes. And there's even some evidence that perhaps it can help treat ADHD. So an all around plant, uh, uh, take a try on it and, and uh, uh, experiment. A lot of our weeds actually can be quite good for us. And then uh, uh, finally, hail. And I'm curious uh, if anyone wants to type into the chat box if you've had hail damage on your gardens already this year. Um, we've had some hail in my house, but it really hasn't done too much damage yet. It's been uh, small enough. Uh, here's some examples of rather, I would say rather mild hail damage, except for this poor watermelon that got all pockmarked earlier in the season. So you can see that you can have quite a bit of damage on the fruit and, and still it hasn't, rot hasn't set in or anything. So, so my, my advice with hail damage is don't panic. If it's like this, the plant's going to grow out of it. Uh, if it's cut off at the base, has no leaves at all left, then you're probably going to be looking at doing maybe a fall planting of vegetables. And, and we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks of, about when to plant. So give, give that a try. Uh, my rhubarb was toast. <laughs> Onions grew out of it in two weeks. And yes, that's one thing I would say is give it about a week to see what the plant might put out as far as new leaves uh, before you make a final decision of replacing the plant. Unless, like I said, it's it's chopped off at the uh, ground level. Tennis ball hail. Hopefully, often when, when we have those really big hail balls, uh, they're a lot more scattered. And uh, But the damage I saw from Belfouche, Sorry, <laughs> I, you have my sympathy. Um, so I'm also curious, and I'd love for people to send me pictures of what kind of uh, what kind of structures they use has hail uh, protection. Here's one out of the Canyon Lake Senior Garden, uh, Senior Citizen Area Garden. And somebody had built these little towers and placed screens over the top. And it looks like uh, they said the window screen wasn't quite enough. They even made some hardware cloth on top of it yet. Yeah. Um, so different ideas. Of course, if your hail comes like it did at Belfouche with a 70 mile an hour wind, it might actually be coming from the side too. But, but uh, you know, you can only do so much, but I would love if people would send me emails of pictures of what they're doing or describe it in your, in your, uh, in the chat box there. Um, and that is all I have for tonight. Uh, so do we have any questions? It looks like we have a question about asparagus. Asparagus, probably about now. Um, usually you can harvest rhubarb a little bit longer than asparagus. Uh, usually we think six to eight weeks of harvest for a good strong patch. Uh, look for when, when the uh, stems start getting quite small, about you know straw size or so. Uh, and if you start seeing them get spindler and spindler, then it's definitely time to stop and and allow those to go ahead and, and leaf out and provide some uh, surface area for for creating the uh, creating the carbohydrates that will renew the roots for next season. All right. So be wrapping up asparagus harvest. <laughs> All right. All right. 
I saw in the chat that a question was posed um, if we had any thoughts on the perennial Gerbera. And, you know, I am not currently aware of any perennial or any Gerbera daisies, which are a beautiful annual flower. We also buy them very often in our cut flower bouquets where they've been grown for those nice, long, gorgeous stems that can also be kind of flimsy and usually need some support in the bouquet. Um, but I am not currently aware of any Gerberas that are hardy this far north, winter hardy this far north as an herbaceous perennial. So um, if, if you've got a picture of a plant tag or more information on that, would love to have you um, send, send me an email and share that with me. Um, but I'd be really hesitant on calling a, a Gerbera daisy a perennial up here in South Dakota. Um, you know, down in a Southern state, sure, no problem. But up here, I'm pretty skeptical. Um, any, if there aren't any other questions tonight, John, I have a question for you about ants. When I was growing up, I uh, loved picking peonies and I always brought them indoors and noticed that there were always ants on them. Do you have any explanation for that? Not a lot. I mean, I've seen the same thing. I mean, they do produce a little of that nectar, which the ants tend to like, but uh, it's kind of like they just go together. I mean, okay. you put honey out there, you're going to get ants too. That's, that's okay. about it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> One thing I was noticing was the advice was if you pick your peonies as the buds are still closed, but you see the petals starting to color up. It's a fun term. That's called the marshmallow stage because the bud's not tight and hard. It's a little puffy like a marshmallow. So if you want to bring it in as a cut flower, that's a good time to do so to keep the ants from coming in there with them. <laughs> You know, that's, that's, that's reasonable. You wouldn't have that, that out yet. So you could probably get it to escape. Of course, you got ants in your house. Once they open, you're going to see ants. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> we'll probably find it, right? Yep. At that point, we'll just call it an indicator flower. You'll find out if you have ants in your house. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. And as we wind down, if you have other gardening questions that come up through the week and you think of other things you want to ask us, please never hesitate to reach out and contact the SDSU Extension Garden Hotline. They're happy to help and they assist South Dakotans across the state. You can email or call any of these numbers. And we certainly look forward to seeing you same time, same place next week. And, you know, how about you bring a friend? We'd love to see some more folks next week and um, spread the word. We're already almost halfway through the garden hour season, believe it or not. Um, but we look forward to tackling questions. I bet we'll be talking about some heat related challenges next week. So with that, again, thank you all for joining us and have a wonderful evening.